Welcome to your live coverage of the New York International Auto Show 2016 on Be Terrific, your official media partner for the 2016 New York International Auto Show here at the Jacob K. Javits Center. I'm Michael Artis. You're the Terrifics. Thanks so much for joining us. I am so excited. We've got such a great guest at Be Terrific TV on all social media. And, of course, you can join our Slack chat. Connect at BeTerrific.com. Tell us you want to join the Slack chat. You, us, and the rest of the Terrifics in 24-hour real-time conversation. When we're live, we'll read your questions and comments on air to our guests. And it's a lot of fun. Keep the great feedback coming. Connect at BeTerrific.com. All right. Our next guest is so amazing. I'm so honored and privileged to have this gentleman on set. He builds some of the most beautiful, elegant, so sleek automobiles on the planet. They're fast. They handle well. And they're just a dream come true. His name is Victor, and he is the founder of Spiker. Spiker is a beautiful car. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you I'm, for joining uh, us. I'm almost blushing. Uh, yeah. Well, you we, should be. I mean, but but I mean, it's the truth. Well, I um, I'm I'm very grateful for your kind words. We uh, started the company 16 years ago, uh, from scratch. Uh, Spiker was a very old brand. It started in 1880, building coaches, very high-end coaches. By 1898, they started making cars, so very early on. Uh, they were the first ever to build a six-cylinder engine in 1903, first ever to make a four-wheel drive car also in 1903, and merged with an aviation company back in 1914. And this is really when the typical Spiker design language er came to be, because Spiker then started building cars like aircraft, like aircraft with no wings. And, um, and that's really where we picked up in 2000 when I started the company. So, I mean, I have a million <laughs> questions for you. I'll just, let's start, let's, you started at the beginning, so let's start at the beginning. How do you say, I want to start Spiker and, and, and actually make that happen? I was uh, uh, the kind of kid that could say car before mummy, yeah. and my mother still pissed off about that, right? Um, I was a car nut from a very young age on. So when I got my driver's license, which in Holland is at the age of 18, I started buying cars. I borrowed money from my grandmother. I worked through law school to, to get the cars I wanted. They were great pickup uh, vehicles too. I mean, you would find anybody would want to join you on a ride, right? Because yeah. I would buy Jaguar E-types and Maserati Sebrings wow. and Alfa Romeos. But they were dirt cheap at the time, right? Yeah. They were worth nothing. And we're talking early 1980s yeah and um, the car market was in the toilet especially the the pre-owned car market yeah, especially for exotics and and but you had to probably work on them yourself yeah I, I, I became really good at it and uh, I could overhaul my own Alfa Romeo engines I was racing them I participated in the Mille Miglia as early as 1982 with wow. the Lancia Aurelia and so I was a true car nut and then by the 90s and my business went very well I started buying new Astons and new Ferraris, and I thought they were really crappily made at the time. <laughs> Not anymore. Right. The, but they're at the beautiful time. today, but you happen to be right. The early 1990s, you're talking like a, a 348 uh, uh, well, Ferrari actually, my or first, a Testarossa? No, I was actually buying a 360 in 99, and I bought a DB7. Oh, you're talking late, late uh, 90s. Yeah, a yeah, DB7 okay. Volante in 97. And, and I thought, you but, know, but those, cars, those cars were better than yeah, the early 90s. but they were still 90s. very plasticky. Okay. And um, I thought, m there must be possible to do something really with a lot of craftsmanship. You happen to be right about the 360. Now that I think of it, it, yeah. it did have a lot of uh, plastic in it. And yeah. It, it was, yeah, okay. I, I mean, it was the most fantastic car to drive, sure. right? And I still have it. It's a fantastic car. The DB7 was not a great car to drive, but it looked fantastic. So when I started to think about creating my own car, Really, it was more or less like uh, a Ferrari and a Aston Martin had a baby. It was a mid-engined super sports car with beautiful looks and the uh, ride and handling of a Ferrari. That was really what I was trying to achieve. And I think, you know, 16 years into the game, we uh, came a long way. Well, wait a second. You, that's a, there's a long way, first of all, between I'd like to have, I mean, every... A kid, boy, would probably say, I would love to have a Ferrari and an Aston have a baby, and uh, I'm going to make that. Uh, you're a long way off. How did you make that happen? And, you know, how do you say, okay, it's one thing to build one for yourself, but to actually bring it to production? Well, I, I ran into a young guy who had designed a car literally in the shed of his parents' house. And it wasn't a very pretty car, but it was a mid-engine car, and he used an Audi V8 from an destructed a8 
and it 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 just triggered my imagination and I started getting involved in the design of the car and then we made one and we took it to the in 2000 we took it to the Birmingham Motor Show in England and all of a sudden people wanted one right they they wanted to buy one so I thought hey maybe there is a there's a business model here so I dusted off the Spiker brand which was the only brand that meant anything in automotive history coming from the Netherlands sure and being an aviation and uh, an automotive company to basically pick up where we left back in 1925 when the company went out of business in terms of design wasn't that complicated. So you bought the name. Yeah. And, and then you had to design the car. Uh, From scratch. Right. And, and, and what I like is, uh, first of all, you've got, uh, other than how it handles and how it drives, it's just so beautifully crafted, the leather, the appointments, but you have this kind of signature uh, shifter. It's a, an aluminum shifter, and then the shift rod goes through the car in aluminum that you can see while you're driving the car, that when you're sitting in it. I really love technology. Yeah. And modern car makers have a tendency of keeping owners of their cars as far away from technology as possible possible, right? Open up the hood of a modern car and you're... You can't see the engine. Well, you can't see the engine. You're darn lucky to find the dipstick. <laughs> and we have a very different view on that. Technology is beautiful, so it should be seen. The exposed gear linkage is a very clear example of that. It's beautiful to see how the mechanism works. Sure. Even on the automatic versions that we sell, the exposed gear linkage works. It only works in one way, right. only directional this way, but it's still beautiful. And that's what by what what our customers buy into. I, I love the aircraft aluminum you have all over the car. You, you've done a phenomenal job. How long does it take you to go from okay? Now we have a business idea. Now I've bought the name. Now I'm going to design the car from scratch to actually being able to sell that in production. Three years. We started in 2000, and the first cars ran off. Well, you can't say production line because it wasn't. Every car is still built as yeah. an individual car. Uh, but it took three years to get them basically a product that you could sell. It took me two more years, two years of hell, to get the US certified. That was really difficult. And you had to crash some, I imagine. Oh, uh, dozens of them. Does that hurt? I mean, because, you know, when Ferrari makes it, or Aston makes it, or even Honda back here, and they've got to crash it, it's like, it's no, to me, that, I mean, they all tell me that it's sad when that happens. It's no big deal. We'll build five more and, and crash them, and we're a big car company, and that's kind of part of the business, but you're a startup, and it's not only that, like the guy who designed the car at Ferrari or the guy who designs the car for Honda doesn't sit in the crash test and isn't watching the car. I didn't sit it. in the crash test either, I can okay. assure you. You don't want to meet crash test dummy. If no, you see no, what no, but I mean watching it and, and sitting no, through I, it. And then you have it's, to watch it's it. It's your baby that you've created true. and now it's being crashed. It's all true, but it's not that bad. The point is, it's no option not to do it. Right. First of all, you can't get certified. So you're just building museum pieces <laughs> because you can never sell them to anyone. So that right. does away with that element. But true. Number two, I'm driving it too, right? Yeah. I want to be driving a safe, safe car. car. Yeah. I want my customers to drive a safe car. And the only way to drive a safe car is to go through the very elaborate process of certification. That means not only emissions, but primarily the crash testing. Sure. And trust me, you do get a better product if you do it, right? It's, it's not that you can rely merely on the, uh, let's say, the, the virtual crash testing, which nowadays, of course, have become a, a piece, a, you know, it's art, sure. how they can do it. And you are within one or two percent of the calculations, but you have to do the confirmatory crash testing in order to be 100% certain that the car behaves the way that you predict. So how proud are you of the vehicle now, the way it is now, and, and when you come to the New York Auto Show and people go, wow, or, or any auto show? It's, it's, it's very nice, yeah. right? It's nice to build something that people appreciate. They see that the craftsmanship is of quite high level, if not the highest level. Um, they appreciate the design in terms of attention to detail. It's drooling all over the place when people look at the gear shifter, at the stitching, at the sh machined uh, parts, the authentic click switches, flip, sure. flip switches. I love those. I, yeah. I guess they're dip switches or yeah. toggle switches. Toggle right? switches, yeah. and they are expensive pieces of kit because they have a fantastic mechanical sound. You know, I, know, I know somebody who uh, makes uh, these toggle switches for airplanes. Yeah, and, and that's where they come from. Oh, we buy them from the parts bin of aircraft. Well, I, I, I can make an introduction if you'd like. Yeah, well, maybe we, you can get a deal. We buy so few. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we'll make 50 per and right, a car, yeah. 
and there may be like 10 switches. So we'll buy 500 switches right. at $50 a piece. So it's a right. I was going to say, they're not cheap. Maybe I you know can that. get them for a little bit less. That's what I'm saying. I'm Dutch. I love to make a I'll, make, I'll make an introduction. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, um, but, but yeah, I, I mean, I know that they're expensive. People think that they're not, but they are. They're, and they're, oh, they're, they're works of art on they're, their own. The reason why they sound so well, which yeah. we find very important, is because they're me metal on the inside, right? right? They're, they're not plastic. Right. So you hear it and customers pick up in a, on it right away. So, um, the, the car is gorgeous. Let's talk about the performance, though. Uh, what's its zero to 60 time? Zero to 60 on the new Preliator is like 3.8 seconds. Wow. It's okay. That's it's quick good. enough. It's yeah. quick enough. Yeah, it's good. What are you, you going to do Really? Faster? It's nice. It's great to be below four, four seconds. But our customers really don't care. Yeah. They don't buy the car because it's the fastest. Because you want the fastest car, you buy Koenigsegg. Sure. If you want uh, zero to 60 below three seconds, there are many ways to sure. skin that cat. They buy our car because they feel it's extremely classy. It's yeah. beautifully crafted. They buy it because nobody else has one. It's exclusive. It's extremely exclusive. It's authentic. That's why they buy it. They buy it for different reasons than performance. Right, absolutely. It's a, it's a given. In our market segment, there are only 10 players. Performance is a given, right? right. There's hyper performance, and there's just supercar performance. We're just a supercar, we're not a hypercar, we're not a Bugatti, and we don't aspire to be. I have no, no inclination to make the fastest car in the world. Yeah. I just don't see the purpose. Well, I, I think you're right. I mean, I always look at that car and say, it gets, gets this to a point where it's like, okay, we had, we, had, uh, we had it on before. And I was like, uh, I mean, what do you do with it? Where do you drive it? Well, I, th I had a discussion with the guys at Geneva about it, and I figured, that if two to three percent of the original Veyron buyers would have actually gone through the effort of stopping the car, taking a separate key, putting it into sill, engaging the top speed sure. mode, and actually driving 240 miles an hour, two percent, that will be high. Right. And, and they agreed with me. Yeah. People, it's, it's more bragging rights than anything right. else. Right. It's wonderful that your car can do it, but have they actually done it? Right. Probably I don't think not. so. Well, first of all, I don't have the uh, Kuhunas to, to drive 200. And where miles can you do it? There are right. so few places where you can actually do it. Well, uh, and, I, and I have a, a lead foot, and I'm saying that. So, uh, what, what's the engine like? Tell me about the engine. We have used since the inception, and we've now built 267 cars, um, Audi V8s. They're bulletproof, they're yeah. fantastic. We never lost an engine. For the Preliator, we have supercharged it. We use a very nice boutique company in uh, Anaheim, in California. VF Engineering, and they make our superchargers. Is it hard to uh, sell cars in, in the United States, especially, or globally, as a small company, because you also have to somehow figure out how to service them? We have 10 dealers in the United States. Mm -hmm. If there are specific problems that cannot be solved locally, we fly in a mechanic. We call that flying doctors. Okay. So it's not really a complicated situation because our customers never use a Spiker as their one and only car right. or, as, or as their first car even, right? So we have very little downtime because of maintenance problems, but if there is something, we send a mechanic. It sounds like uh, you, you've driven a lot of different cars. And, yeah. And, and I mean, how often do you drive yours? Well, I am in a very fortunate situation that I live in a beautiful climate in Mallorca, Spain, and I have a, a black C8 Spider, which is always open. Yeah. So I drive my car a lot. That's pretty cool. It's nice. Yeah. If you ever in doubt, you know, if I would ever be in doubt why I do what I do, I take the car and I go for a drive in the hills, and then I know. It's, it's beautiful. Thank you for taking the time with us. I appreciate my it. My pleasure. This is the New York International Auto Show. It's an amazing show. A lot of debuts here. Um, you're a car guy. Do you still get giddy walking around the show and, and, and seeing, like, yeah. even the Bugatti or... Uh, you know, the Koenigsegg, or maybe you just wander over to Porsche, which isn't far from you. No, I, I, I absolutely do that. It's a, a source of inspiration to find everything under one roof. It's very inspiring to see how technology is now becoming more and more accessible. Technology also is an, a tremendously enhancing safety, which is a very valuable element of the equation. So, no, we, we just walk around like hunters to see yeah. what's up, what's happening now, and what's happening next, and, uh, and how we can translate that into our own car. 
but do you ever just forget that you're in the car business for a minute and that you're a manufacturer and walk around and go, ah, you know what, I like what Honda's doing or I, I like what uh, Mercedes has done here and just be that boy again who w was so kind of caught up with cars. Do you ever just kind of disconnect yourself? Uh, that's, that would be very hard here. Yeah. But for instance, my favorite event of the year yeah. is the Pebble Beach Concours sure. Elegance. It's the single best car event in the world as far as I'm concerned. I never missed one since 1991. And if I walk around there, where the beauty of the car as such, all cars, has been taken to another level, that's where I tend to forget that I'm a car manufacturer, but not for long, because even in the, let's say, pre-war cars, there's so much inspiration for what we do today. The craftsmanship that goes into an Isotta Freschini sure. or a pre-war Bentley or a phenomenal Rolls-Royce, it, it was, it was a, like a craft gone missing. And I think we've brought it back. Very cool. So we know you have a 360. What else do you have? Well, I, have, uh, I bought a, a Vanquish, an wow. original Vanquish back in 2001 when it wow. just came out. I kept that too. Um, and I have uh, a Lancia Aurelia, I have a Lancia Flaminia, Berlina. I have um, a Ferrari 250 Tour de France. So wow. I have a lot of uh, nice cars. Very nice. Very nice. Um, overall, favorite car of all time, not including your own favorite car of all time. And it could be as a boy, the car you always wanted, the poster you had on your wall. The best car, the nicest car I ever had was a Ferrari 250 Monza racer. The wow. 1954 participant in the uh, Carrera Panamericana. Wow, that's a pretty Where amazing it came car. fifth, yeah. It had the Lampredi V12, so the pre-Colombo V12. It was the best sounding car of all time. Wow, that is... Sensational Scaglietti body with the yeah. fairing. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, and the mobile horses prancing on the, on the front wings. That was the prettiest car I ever had. Yeah, you, st you don't have, still have it. If I had had it, I would have probably retired by now. <laughs> I sold it and it was the single worst decision in my lifetime. Well, you, you didn't know at the time or you just needed you I needed should to? have known. You should have, yeah. yeah. I, last year I got the, uh, the privilege of interviewing Jim Glickenhaus. Oh yeah, and his another own. passionate car guy. Yes. Great guy. Great guy, great, great guy. guy, phenomenal guy. And the uh, P3, P4 uh, Ferrari that he has. Um, Done by a, one of the best designers I've ever met, yeah. Jason Castriota. And, and it was the first thing that jumped to my mind when you said that they hide the technology now and they hide the engine. Because when he opened up for us that, you know, that back deck and you could see the engine, I almost lost my mind. Yeah. And when, when I watch that interview back, I just I get so excited about that. And it's so true. You can't see into a car today. And, and that's why I love what you're doing. Your, your car is so beautiful. And we're not alone. If you look at the market in which we operate, there are basically three boutique players. Let's sure. call them boutique players. There's Pagani, yeah. there's Koenigsegg, and there's us. Any of the three will do exactly the same thing. We'll show technology. Look at a Pagani, but look at the Koenigsegg Regera here. Sure. I mean, it's a piece of art. It's unbelievably well, beautifully crafted. I, I, would, I would argue a little bit. I think the Koenigsegg, to me, is a little bit more mainstream and it looks a little bit more like a traditional supercar. If you didn't know, I think you could confuse it with a Ferrari. You could confuse it uh, with several other you know, high-end vehicles. Um, certainly a Bugatti. To me, your car stands out and even if you don't know what it is, you know it's something spectacular, special, and different, and you would never go, is that a Ferrari? Is that a Maserati? Is it a Porsche? Is it an Alfa? You would never, ever do it. And to me, your car is a work of art. Well, I think I consider that a serious compliment, but I tend to disagree with you. I think a Koenigsegg and also a Pagani, they stand out in their own right. Yeah. They found their own design language to the point that they have become icons and unmistakably identifiable. So maybe I'm just too much, too knee deep into this industry, but I would never miss out a Koenigsegg or confuse it with a Ferrari. No, you wouldn't, and I no. wouldn't, but that's not what I'm saying, like the normal person might walk up to yeah, but it. But normal per person wouldn't even know what a Koenigsegg or Spiker or Gani is in the first place, right? They would that's only true. walk up to a Ferrari and rec recognize it because of the prancing no, I, horse. Listen, I had an NSX years ago. Yeah, well, and, there you go. And that's people a would confusing say me, situation. And people would say to me all the time, they'd go, I like your Ferrari. And yeah. I'd go, what Ferrari? And yeah, they go, where's yeah. the horse, man? I go, they go, I like your Ferrari. And i go, 
But that's an NSX. Yeah, well, you can't you can please everybody, that's yeah. for sure. An NSX is a great car in its own right. Maybe it's, it's a little less explicit in its design sure. language than, for instance, a Koenigsegg or a Spyker. But I think we don't try to please everyone well, you with what we're doing. Because and you can't, because then you get a car that is so bland that it's basically appealing to no one. Well, look, and, and the reality is, a little bit, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? Somebody might not like your design, but well, they might like the Koenigsegg. I like your design. I'm not as big a fan of the Koenigsegg. It's okay, I'm, it's okay. you know, that's fine. That's right. right. And, and our customers are so wealthy that they never ha are in the situation that they have to make a choice. Right. They can just buy a Koenigsegg <laughs> and a Pagani and a Spyker and a P1 and a LaFerrari and they don't need to think about that. That must be pretty cool. I'm aspiring to that position. <laughs> I've <laughs> never made it further than my own spikers, but anyway, I had a lot of nice Ferraris. Your, your spiker is, is amazing, and the fact that you've created it is pretty cool. It's wonderful to create something that people admire, aspire to, appreciate, and, and are desirous of driving, owning. Yeah. It's of course very important to have people that actually want to buy one. Right? Sure. Because look, at, look, look what's happening in the industry, right? Since we started, I think Pagani started in 99, Koenigsegg and I started, Christian and I started, in 2000. Since then, in the past 16 years, there must have been 200 startups that tried to become a player yeah. in that very small niche of super supercars. They're all dead. It's hard. Well, that's why I was asking you the whole story, and you you kind of glossed over it. I made you come back to it because it's you know you made it sound simple, but it wasn't. And it yeah, was. But the point is, yeah. I think the essence is that a lot of those a lot of those startups think that if they just make something really technically attractive, people are going to buy it. But it's not true. Right. If you wanted to buy something, you need to have a brand, a story. Spiker is all about the story. Sure. People are buying into the story. And of course they're engineered nice, and of course they are beautifully crafted. But there's a story behind it. And if you don't have that story, it's going to be very tough sell. Would that be your advice to young entrepreneurs? Uh, there are startups all over, but I, I, I think that that's actually really good advice. Is that you know that's what we're about telling stories. Telling stories. Yeah. I mean, that's this why this interview isn't two minutes. <laughs> that, that's right, and it is about telling stories. In order to win the win over the hearts of those that can actually afford your product, it, there are two things very important, and I think I got them right from the outset. First of all because I was the ultimate buyer of my own product. So I knew what I was looking at, sure. right? Because I was buying Aston's and Ferraris. Um, but the main thing is to understand that you should not just be marketing at your target group, because your target group will never buy your product if nobody else knows what it is. Sure. So if you drive along High Street and not a kid will say, Daddy, Daddy, a spiker, right? The guy in the car is gonna feel a little bit awkward sure. because nobody knows that he just paid three hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars for an amazing piece of car. So my marketing has always been two-tier at the at the clients, sure, and they're so easy to find. That's that's not difficult. You that's go to Le Mans. We went eight eight times to Le Mans. You go to Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. You take them to the best auto shows, and you'll find your customers. Sure, but if you do not make sure that there is an aspirational group from fifteen-year-olds that put spiker pictures on the wall of their bedroom and say, when I grow up, that's the car I want to have, you'll never sell a car because there's no aspiration. But that's very hard for people to understand. I see so many stars. We do CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. We do NAB, the National Association of Broadcasters. We do Comic-Con. I mean, that's one of the biggest shows in the world. 16 million viewers we have on that, on that show, 10 million on, on uh, CES. I think the thing is, though, that a lot of these companies, they don't realize and they don't that they have to market and even if they're in a much lower category or much lower brand that if they don't make people aspire to their product or want their product the, it makes it harder and they they don't understand that they say oh you know i'm just going to try and get the free press i can get or i'm just going to do this or i'm just going to make a great product you have to make a great product but you have to market it it's as well. a and, given that you yeah. have to make a great product there is no reason of being if you don't right. but the sheer thought that making a good product is let's say identical to sales is a serious misconception, right? You can make the best and the nicest car in the world and nobody will ever buy it if there is no story that is being told to the point that there is greed, there's desire for your product, right? We all remember Michael Douglas in Wall Street, right? Yes. Greed is good. Well, greed is good because people should be aspiring to your car so badly that they want one. Yeah. If they tell everybody else that they want one, 
the guy that can actually afford one is going to buy one. Right. Very, very true. I think it was, you, you, you nailed it. Um, and you, you certainly understand it well. The hardest car you've ever had to work on? Huh. I, um, I had a 1904 De Dion Bouton. Wow. With a four cylinder engine, a five liter four cylinder engine. Uh, a beast of its time. And I did uh, the um, London to Brighton run a few times with it. That was hard work. A fully exposed body, yeah. um, a steering wheel like this, and a lot of power with a car with no brakes. In the rain, in England, in November. Wow. That was tough. I, I could imagine. That, that was tough. The most fun car you've ever driven? Uh, that, and, and not including my own, right? Yeah, not including your own. Because sometimes I would say Le Mans with the spikers, but um, I would say... I feel like that's a given. We, we have to know that. Yeah, 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 you have to know that. No, but I would say driving the Millimilla with a 250 Millimilla, yeah, a 250mm. Yeah. I mean, driving into town with police uh, motorbikes in front of you at 200 k an hour, just shifting 5, 4, 3 and then blasting out of town and the Italians yelling, Forza, Forza, Forza! It is something you have to experience. Put that on your bucket list if you've never done it. It's, it's <laughs> out of this world. All right, it's on my bucket list now. Good. Top five cars of all time in your mind. Oops, you're now, now it's getting tough. I would say, I would say that um, the most elegant post-war car is still to me the Jaguar E-Type Series 1. Yep. Uh, sure, because that, that car is so well balanced, yep. it redefined design. I think a car that you cannot discount is the car that has been in production for over 50 years. And what is more, let's say, classic and yet modern than a Porsche 911, right? Yep. It's, it's, it's such a classic. And what they nail at Porsche is proportions. You can close your eyes and you can still see whether it's a Porsche, you know, 50 years into the production line. That is an achievement from a design perspective of gigantic proportions. Yes. Um, I am a serious Ferrari fan, yeah. right? So I, I think that the 250 Monza with the Scaglietti body is beyond elegant. Yeah. Pre-war, I would say the most elegant car is the Alfa Romeo 8C, wow. the Touring. It's a good The a Touring good Spider, the 19, early 1930s eight-cylinder cars, they are, they are of a unique design. They were Touring Superleggera designs. They were, well, the price of today will translates how beautiful they are. Having gone to Pebble Beach for the past 25 years, you get to see cars like that. And I think the Touring Alpha, the 8C is. So one more to go. One more. Now all of a sudden there's many choices because <laughs> there's so many pretty cars. I would say, I love Lanchas. I've yeah. always loved Lanchas. And I think that the Lancia Aurelia Spider, um, I had the privilege of owning a few is such a beautiful design, Lancia Aurelia Spider, Very because nice. it is what I want to achieve with my car. It's it's sporty, it's elegant, but it's super super classy, super classy. Put on wire wheels, and you have the most elegant means of transport ever. Well, I can assure you, people will also be talking about your car for cars for years and years. To I come. hope hundred so. years from now they'll still I be hope going. So. That's a spiker. So yeah. that's pretty pretty good achievement. It seems like uh, are you and Christian close? It seems like very you're close. And, and is there a friendly competition? Absolutely, there no. There is no competition <laughs> whatsoever because not one single customer of ours, of his, of mine, has to choose. But I don't even mean that. I mean, is there like a friendly competition? Like, oh, he did this, and I want to. No, you know, no, 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 no. It's just cheering each other on. Oh yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, totally. We're, we're very much enjoying each other's success. Very cool. I find him, I always call him the nicest guy in the industry. He is the nicest guy in the industry. Who inspired you when you were a child? He probably says the same about you, by the way. Maybe, maybe, I hope so. Um, I've always been inspired by, by serious entrepreneurial leaders. I'm, I'm, I, I read all the books you can read about a guy like Winston Churchill, sure. because of there's just out a new book by the mayor of London, Boris Johnson, and he called it the Churchill Factor, how one man basically changed the entire century, the previous century. And I, I'm always very much inspired by that type of literature, that out of books about larger than life characters, 
and he was definitely one. What the book I read not so long ago, of course, was about Steve Jobs. I mean, a larger than life character. Yes. A man with a very obnoxious side, but also a man with sheer genius, yeah. right? I love that. No, that yeah. was a great book. Too. That's a great book, yeah. Isaac. Thank you so much for all your time. It was tremendous. My pleasure. Uh, you know, the, the terrifics would say that this was an epic interview. I know that. <laughs> I, I feel it. And, and it's rare for me to feel that. So thank you. And it's not because of me, it's because of you. Well, thank you so much. So, I enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you for coming on. I know that they're loving this, and I appreciate every second you gave us. And I look forward to doing more in the future. We'll be here. The Spiker. Check it out. If you don't already know it, I'm sure you do now. And uh, that's it. That's your live continuing coverage from the New York International Auto Show on Be Terrific, an official media partner. We're very proud of that, and we're very proud of you. You are the Terrifics. You make Be Terrific special. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Michael Artsis. Don't go anywhere.